Foundation. So together we're co-moderators because we figured both estuaries, we need the representation from both. So yes. um, I've been executive director at Florida Oceanographic for 36 years. I grew up in Florida, uh, grew up on the St. Lucie Estuary, went away to college, Merchant Marine, came back in 78. And I've been there since advocating to try to protect and preserve those waters. Um, we've got a lot, a lot of issues there, and it's degraded quite a bit since when I was growing up there. And I know that the next generation needs, uh, needs a lot of, uh, of help to get there too. So what part of my job is at Florida Oceanographic, we, we do a lot of education and wells research and also restoration through oyster reefs and seagrass restoration and other work in the St. Louis Estuary and uh, Indian River Lagoon. So I encourage you to you know, get more about the Oceanographic and find out that. I want to introduce and let Rayann introduce herself and then I'll introduce the rest of the panelists. Rayann. Thank you, Mark. Rayann Wessel, I'm here on behalf of the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation, where I serve as the Natural Resource Policy Director. My background's in limnology and marine science, and so uh, I bring the um, scientific side to try to bring the science that we do through our marine laboratory and habitat and wildlife management divisions into the policy and regulatory realm. Glad to be here, glad to see you all. Great. Next to Rayan, we have uh, Gary Goforth. Gary is a uh, uh, engineer and scientist. He's a PhD and has PE in environmental engineering. Um, he's also president of Gary Goforth Incorporated and I always like it when a person puts their name on the business. So that's really important. He was uh, also with the South Florida Water Management District as a lead environmental engineer for design, construction, and operation of the STAs, which we are known as stormwater treatment areas. And that was from 1986 to 2004. Uh, he recently completed uh, nutrient performance measures for all tributaries to Lake Okeechobee, St. Lucie, and the Caloosahatchee River's estuaries, and he's currently working to ensure his grandkids can experience the reality and beauty of, of restored estuaries and Everglades ecosystems. So we're glad for that. <laughs> Next to uh, Gary, we have Howie Gonzalez. Howie is uh, He's been a program, he is the program manager and chief of the ecosystem branch at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Jacksonville District. And he's leading uh, the planning and design and construction of the South Florida ecosystem restoration programs and projects. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez has a 20 year career with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, managing multiple water resource projects um, in Sacramento and New Orleans uh, uh, Corps districts. Howie has, uh, was born and raised in New Orleans and Louisiana and received his undergraduate and graduate degrees in engineering and business administration from the University of New Orleans. Help me welcome Howie Gonzalez. <laughs> Next to him and on the far, far left there, far right to you, is uh, our governing board member, Mitch Hutchcraft, uh, one of nine governing board members for the South Florida Water Management District. His term is basically, his governing award is uh, from 2013 to 2017. He was appointed by Governor Rick Scott. He has his education, of course, in master's in urban planning, uh, regional planning, and also bachelor's in, in landscape architecture from uh, University of Florida, both from University of Florida. So he's a Florida person. So if you're a Seminole, you got to kind of stay, oh, well. You know, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, he is also his occupation is as vice president of real estate for King Ranch and Consolidated Citrus. He's a member of the Lee County Planning uh, Agency. He's a member of Mark County Enterprise uh, Zone Development Agency. Uh, board member in Habitat and Humanity in Lee County and Henry Counties. And he's also a member of the Southwest Florida Education uh, Committee for Henry County. So help me welcome Mitch Hutchcraft. <laughs> so. My, my job today is to kind of uh, get you, or I get the job to overview very quickly and then jump into the St. Lucie Estuary. And then what we'll do from there is I'll turn it over to, um, to Rayanne Wessel and she's gonna take off with the um, West Coast and the Caloosahatchee. And then we're gonna move to, to Gary, talk about more South and STAs and Howie on the core perspective. And of course, Mitch on the uh, uh, Water Management District perspective. So if we could cue the slides over there. Here we there we go. Oh, there it was. There it is. So my job again is to talk about the northern estuaries and the reasons to send water south. And I'm going to give you this kind of quick overview. 
Uh, the upper chain of lakes at the top of the image there were our uh, series of uh, lakes that are connected and interconnected hydraulically uh, down to Lake Kissimmee. Uh, those upper chains flow south to Lake Kissimmee and then Lake Kissimmee flows south in the 105 mile long river. It oxbowed back and forth like a natural river with a two mile wide floodplain. And the water used to take about six or eight months to reach Lake Okeechobee from the upper chain. As he continued south, the water used to flow south uh, through the river of grass, aptly described by Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in her book, The Everglades River of Grass, a shallow kind of flow uh, pattern of uh, Everglades about 60 miles wide and about one to two feet deep. And that river flowed in one mile every four days. So it took another 16 months for that water to gradually reach to the Florida. And that timing is really important to remember as we talk about restoration, how we restore things. It's not only the water quality or water quantity when you talk about the timing, how this timing actually happened. But back then we wanted to, we had a mantra in, in Florida at the turn of the century in 1900s. We wanted, even before that, we wanted to drain the swamp. We wanted to get rid of that swamp Everglades south of the lake. It was valueless. It was, uh, the state legislature appealed to anybody to come down to help uh, drain it. And we did a pretty good job at that through the 70s. And then in uh, 1926 and 28, we had two severe hurricanes that came across and obviously killed many people around the lake. So the Herbert Hoover Dyke was authorized in 1930 and completed in 1937. That diked around the lake and obviously stopped or, uh, that river grass flow uh, going south from Lake Okeechobee. So currently we have what we have on the left hand side and that is the major outlets to, uh, the, from the lake when the lake gets too high are east and west. And they reestablished the St. Lucie Canal on, on the east coast, was started in 1916. Uh, completed in 1926 and then improved after the Herbert Hoover Dyke to have a large capacity like you see the arrows there to uh, control the lake levels in preparation for hurricane season. We also dump water out to the east coast and the west coast at about 1.7 billion gallons a day and I know you can't read the bottom of the slide here I don't know why it's cutting off at the bottom but the, the what I had also down there was about it's six million dollars a day is that cost at a, at a normal utility cost for Miami-Dade utility at, at about three dollars and forty-eight cents a thousand gallons. So that equates to about two point two billion dollars a year in just the cost of the water alone going out to the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico. So not talking about pollution or anything, we're talking about just the water, waste of water. That's billions of dollars every year that's wasted. So what happens on the East Coast? Uh, we look at these uh, situations. You see Lake Okeechobee there on the left, and you see the dark line on the bottom is the St. Lucie Canal, or called C-44 Canal. And then there are other two C canals, C-23 and 24, which were built later, back in the 40s and 50s, primarily to drain that area in, in North Martin, South St. Lucie County for primarily citrus. And you can see how they enter into the North Fork, the natural North Fork of the St. Lucie. The North Fork comes down from the winding top of the very top of the picture. The winding North Fork is still naturally there. Um, it's about 23 and a half miles north of Stewart. And then the South Fork comes up from the south, almost touching Loxahatchee, about another 10 and a half miles to it comes to Stewart. Both converge at Stewart. They turn east and are connected to the St. Lucie Inlet, to the ocean, and the Indian River Lagoon. And you can see how that tidal influence goes all the way up to the south and North Forks and uh, creates these tidal estuaries which are so productive. Where is a natural watershed was just right around those boundaries of the North and South Fork, about 100,000 acres, but with the canals and the C-44 and C-23-24 expanded out about 514,000 acres. So almost five times bigger, we've increased that watershed. So we have local watershed issues. But what happened in uh, the discharges in, uh, I don't know why it did that, sorry about that. But uh, the May through October in 2013, those discharges happened uh, from Lake Okeechobee. Uh, we, we got about 418,000 acre feet or 136 billion gallons. And then there was uh, to the West Coast, Clusahatchee, they had 970,000 uh, acre feet, 318 billion gallons. Now to put that in perspective, we talked about wasting 1.7 billion. All of us in South Florida, about 7.7 .7 million people who live in South Florida, we consume about 1.3 billion gallons a day. So we're wasting to tide 1.7 billion, and you just see what happened this discharge over this period of time, just this 
summer of 2013. We dumped huge amounts of water east and west. Look at the bottom figure in red, 79,000 acre feet, that 26 billion gallons. With, that was all that went from Lake Okeechobee to the Everglades. In the meantime, all the agricultural areas south had stormwater runoff at about 765,000 acre feet or 249 billion gallons. That went down into the water conservation areas. There was not enough capacity, again, to flow this water south. And it's primarily engineered and designed to go east and west. Has this happened over the years? Absolutely. If you look back at this period of record, uh, back to the 1965 on the left-hand side of 2013, there were several times when we get more than 400,000, 200 to 400,000 acre feet of, of discharges to the St. Lucie estuary. And you can see some of the peak years in 1998 uh, at 344 billion gallons that, that year was tremendous discharge to the St. Lucie. Now, what does that do locally? Well, I showed you on the previous slide, there was phosphorus, nitrogen, you know, several metric tons of nitrogen and phosphorus, and also TSS, which is total suspended solids. That's all the silt and sediment that pours out. There were 6,800 metric tons just in 2013. So what happens here is the oyster reefs. Um, these are some of the oyster reefs within the St. Lucie estuary. In the 1940s, we had about 470 acres. Uh, the 1996 was another survey for about 260 acres, and I don't know why it cut it off, but in 2003, uh, there was 116,000 acres at that time. So um, these were oyster reefs, and what happened to the salinity, uh, which is the saltiness of the water in the middle estuary is ideal for oysters at around 10 to 25 parts per thousand. And the normally it stays, as you see on the graph on the left side, at about 20 to 25 parts per thousand. Fresh water is zero, the ocean is 35, so you get kind of a scale, and that, that's ideal. But what happened in June of 13, you can see it dropped below this critical line of five parts per thousand in salinity. It stayed for a long period of time. We lost 100% of our living oyster reefs uh, during 2013. The other damages that are done to another critical habitat in our area are the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, sea grasses that are right inside the St. Lucie Lake, we have about 700 acres. I don't know, I'm totally apologize for this it's messed up here, um, but it's about 700 acres of seagrass. You can see the dark shaded areas. And what happens during discharge is they get covered over with uh, huge amounts of silt and sediment, but also blocks the light from penetrating the grass. And, and even the low salinities below 15 parts per thousand start to kill seagrass. And it stayed there for a critical time. Um, over 14 days, so obviously 95 days or so, and we lost about 75% of the seagrass cover. The other stuff that happens is also that muck and silt and sediment that settles out in the larger part of the estuary. You can <clears throat> dig it up with your anchor like I did here. There's over 12 million cubic yards of that stuff, and it reflocculates and resuspends itself during high wind and wave conditions uh, in the estuary. We get fish with lesions. Uh, there were nine different events from 1983 on forward. Uh, that were documented as fish with lesions or abnormalities that appear during these peak discharge times affecting 33 different species and 6% of the population. And then the last thing about our health issues, on the left side you see health warnings being posted by the health department for either toxic algae, microcystis algae, or harmful bacteria, high levels of bacteria. And these health warnings didn't get posted uh, for the microcystis algae until 2004. And after that, we saw about six different events up to 2013 where we got these postings. And how would that be for your economy if you were trying to promote the economy of our river and come see our beautiful St. Lucie Estuary or Indian River Lagoon? You would have these signs posted at boat ramps, the, the waters would be green, and you're not allowed to come in contact because it forms a heptatoxin, which is bad for your liver. So on this side, though, I kind of outlined that about $840 million a year is attributed to the water related in Martin and St. Lucie County alone. And that includes the sales and marinas and boat, fishing, bait tackle, but also personal income. And we create about almost 27,000 jobs are created by um, you know, the different industries and, and those things. And then about in the hotel motel, I know you can't see it below there, we have tourism about $115 million a year annually for visitation to our beaches and our our waterways. So totally about $840 million a year attributed to that. Are we doing some restoration efforts? Yes, in the uh, St. Lucie Indian River Lagoon South Plan covers our St. Lucie watershed. 
you'll hear of the C44 project being, being built. That'll take care of some of the discharge water in the C44 basin, not the Lake Okeechobee discharges, but in that C44 basin, it'll help to store and to treat that water before it goes back in the estuary and hopefully reduce some of those levels. So lastly, what is it that we really desire? We see the historical flow on the left. The middle is where we currently are. And ideally, we want enough uh, storage, treatment, and conveyance of water from the lake south in order to uh, basically get stop those damaging discharges to the coastal estuary. So we need to move water south. And that's how we're on. So now, we will queue up uh, Rayanne as she comes up. And I'll uh, close this one out. And Rayanne will talk more about the, the West Coast and uh, what goes on there. And we'll, we'll go on from that. And hopefully her slides will look, you know, lined up better than mine. And probably yeah, drove your eyes crazy. Yeah, that's, that's Thank you, Mark. Great, so let's jump across the state and uh, take a look at the Caloosahatchee, the, the other large discharge that, that comes out of Lake Okeechobee from this uh, Greater Everglades ecosystem. The Lake Okeechobee is outlined in yellow, and the pink area is the Caloosahatchee watershed. It's an 800,000 acre watershed. It's bigger than the EAA. So two and a half times of Lake Oak, two and a half Lake Okeechobees could fit in this watershed. And that's just to tell you how significant our watershed is in this overall equation. In contrast to the, to the St. Lucie, the Caloosahatchee has a conundrum. We call it the Goldilocks principle because not only do we get 70% of the unwanted water when there's way too much water comes out this discharge, the 75 mile long river, um, but we also end up getting shortchanged on water that we need out of Lake Okeechobee in dry season and droughts. Um, and so there is an example here that I'm using uh, of the same month, three years apart. You remember 2005 was a massive uh, a flood year. We had, we had record rainfalls and, and hurricanes. And in June of that year, we had so much water coming out the Caloosahatchee that on the left-hand side, you'll see the plume of dark water coming through our barrier islands and extending some 20 miles offshore. And that went on for the entire wet season. By contrast, just three years later, we had the reverse. We were in uh, the depths of the drought, the second year of a drought in 2008. Uh, the water was cut off entirely uh, in lieu of sending it to the EAA, and we ended up in a stagnated condition. This is a picture on the right-hand side of the Franklin Lock, which is our last lock and dam, the one that is the, the estuary interface on our side. So the water, the dark water downstream is the tidally influenced Gulf of Mexico, and uh, that lovely shade of puce behind it is the microcystin bloom that went on for uh, many months uh, because of the stagnation and the lack of water. So those nutrients were in the water column, were blooming and, and extending. Now that has only one place to go and that's downstream to our, our productive fishery. So where does the water come from? Just a, a little uh, contrast because again on our side we have some uh, such a significant watershed that it can be very different from one year to the next and I want to introduce you to two uh, years the past two years and how different they were uh, so this is 2014 the green is what's coming off of our watershed the blue on this graph is what's coming out of Lake Okeechobee and you can see that for the year of 2014 91 percent of our flow is coming out of the watershed only 9% out of Lake Okeechobee. So while it's very common to hear people blame all the flows on Lake Okeechobee, this is an example of one of those variabilities that's not always uh, so easy to peg. But by contrast, the very wet year of 2013 was, which also uh, did some funny things, uh, also same color scheme, uh, but we had a very different profile where 50 to 85 percent of the flow was coming out of our watershed and 20 to 62 percent of that water was coming uh, out of Lake Okeechobee. What that starts to, to help you see perhaps is that, you know, water coming out of Lake Okeechobee, if it weren't coming to us when we don't need it, uh, we could be a lot more um, balanced and so that would be helpful. And in, in terms of historic flows, you know, 1.3 million acre feet per year uh, is, is kind of an average. And, and so it's a, it's a significant amount of water that um, 
that we could be looking at distributing south, some 14 miles offshore. When that happens, Keep in mind that the estuary, that mixing zone for salt and fresh water, where all the nursery species are, are gathering and, and doing their business, it's completely washed out and there's no place in the Gulf for that to occur. So we're losing your classes of spawn. Uh, just to, to put another face on it, the red in this picture is showing the plume and how it went out into Pine Island Sound and Matlache Pass, and these are aquatic preserves, so they are affected additionally. Uh, you can see the graph on the left-hand side where we had four months of water so fresh that um, in, continuously that we lost 100% of our oysters in the Caloosahatchee. Further downstream, they survived, but again, you're, you're talking about 100 days of totally fresh conditions, and, and you're wiping out the spawn. Wow. On the flip side, so that's too much water. Now we're talking about our conundrum going to accommodate about 170,000 acre feet. There are a variety of other projects. They don't get us to that 450,000 acre feet, but to address those watershed discharges, we do have to have storage within our own watershed as well as water moving south out of Lake Okeechobee. Just to key this up, uh, we know from the SERP that with Kissimmee we need about 1 million acre feet of storage. That included a lot of ASR around Lake Okeechobee, which as we heard today probably is not going to occur. And then uh, south of the lake in the EAA we need a million to a million and a half acre feet of storage. Just to help everybody imagine what or picture what 1 million acre feet or what a, an acre foot looks like it's a football field with one foot of water on it that's an acre foot so if we need one million we need one million football fields we can stack them up though we don't have to spread them out so uh, just to give you some concept of the of the volume for the c43 on the west coast our this reservoir um, on 11,000 acres it would it would accommodate 170,000 acre foot of, of uh, water and we have two test cells that have been designed and operated uh, to evaluate how that would work. We still need a water quality treatment component on this reservoir, so that is, in addition to getting that started, uh, being able to clean up the water is a key, key part of that. So we're looking for ideas and, and plans on how we move water south. This is a water management district slide that was presented in, in Ju July of 2013. And if you remember, 2013 started with a bang. It was the fifth wettest July on record. So the turquoise areas here show what was flooded, what was overstaged. And you'll notice that there's just one spot south of the lake in the EAA where there was not an excess of water, but everyone else was flooded. And being the, fir the, the front end of the wet season, that means that anything that comes behind that um, is, is already saturated. So we had uh, the worst case uh, with that rain coming uh, so terribly early. The idea here is not to, to look backwards, but to look forwards. We learn from, the, from, from what we've uh, seen the operation of the system do. And so what we want to do is look for opportunities, for where those um, uh, opportunities are, whether they're operational or project-based, and where, what the constraints are. And it really boils down to uh, the contrast between uh, what we have, what we have to lose, uh, what we have on a good day, and what we have uh, when, when the, the um, conditions have, have uh, tanked. Because we lost a thousand acres of cape grass habitat, and that's been permanently lost. We lost in 2013 uh, the 100% the, the, um, of the oyster in um, the Caloosahatchee, in order to get those back to feed our $3 billion tourism industry and 43,600 jobs in our region, uh, it's going to take some, some creative thinking, but I think we have the, the brain power here to try to do that. So I'll, I'll let us think about that as we hear the rest of the presentations. Thank you.